Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about detection limits. They're really important because they can tell you how good an instrument can detect analytes in very, very small concentrations. So there's sort of three different terms that analytical chemists will use when they talk about the detection limit. Instrument detection limit, method detection limit, and limit of quantification. But they're all trying to get at the same thing, which is how low can you go? How good is an instrument at measuring an analyte? How much analyte do you need in order to distinguish the signal of that analyte from the intrinsic noise that might be present even in the absence of anything running through the machine? So a good analogy might be to think about how you hear my voice in this lecture. So in that example, the volume of my voice was below the detection limit of your ear, and you couldn't hear what I was saying. If I whisper, you might just be able to hear me. In that case, I'm probably approaching the detection limit of at least some of your ears. And if I'm talking like I am now, hopefully I'm well above the detection limit. So signal has to be large enough from an analyte in order to exceed the intrinsic noise of the instrument. And that's the basic idea. And as we compare different atomic spectroscopies, detection limits are a very powerful and important discriminator between the different options. So let me start with kind of a graphical view of what it is we're talking about. So, so we all know that as a function of concentration, the signal on an optical emission spectrometer is going to increase, we hope, linearly. And that's going to be the basis of calibration, which we are going to spend a lot of time on next week. But what I want to talk to you about is what isn't present in the curve that I'm showing you, which is the noise. In any measurement, there's an intrinsic amount of noise that can be present. And it's really going to change and influence particularly the lower limits. Say you want to measure a signal that's very, very tiny. Is the signal, I think that's the fundamental question behind doing this. Is the signal greater than the noise? So that's really the purpose of a detection limit, is to help you define in a quantitative way whether the signal you've measured is statistically different from noise. So the first kind of detection limit we're going to define then is the instrument detection limit. The IDL is measured by with blanks, and it's really important. It's going to simply be a solution injected into your instrument that contains no lead, something you're certain contains no lead. It's called your blank. What you're going to do is take 10 of those samples. Now, different sources vary. I'm going by what your methods that you have for the determination of lead in children's toys use. And for their IDLs, they use 10 reagent blanks. A reagent blank is not just water. It contains the same solvent that your samples will be prepared in. And I'm assuming here, let's say, concentrated nitric acid. What you're going to do is measure those materials in your system. Now, in the ideal world, they would be zero, but there could be an offset, which you'll correct for in the calibrations later. But nevertheless, you're going to be measuring a bunch of signals 10 different times. And if you've learned anything from week one, you know those are not going to be all the same value. As you see, you're going to measure 10 different signals that are kind of spread around the value that you want. But you know that you can calculate the spread of these numbers to be the standard deviation. And it's the standard deviation of these blanks that we're going to use to define our instrument detection limit. And that should be detection, not signal. And so what that's going to be in this case is 3 times the standard deviation. And why is it 3? Because that's going to be a t value of a 99% confidence interval, n equals 7. I know you're doing it for 10 measurements, but it's pretty much convention to use this number 3. And that's indeed what's shown in your actual handout. Now, the method detection limit is a very different kind of thing. So the IDL is kind of the best case scenario. It's nitric acid running through your system. But in many, many instruments, the presence of even a little tiny bit of the analyte can actually change the noise that you measure. It can be for a variety of reasons. Maybe your sample has a little bit of dirt in it. Maybe the lead itself is depositing on some part of your detector and messing it up. You can come up with all sorts of reasons. But analytical chemists usually use the method detection limit as kind of the actual detection limit. So if somebody isn't telling you if it's an IDL or an MDL, it's probably an MDL. And the difference between the instrument detection limit is the MDL has just a little tiny bit of lead in it because you're trying to capture the noise that's present when there's actually some amount of analyte or some very small amount of analyte. It's not perfect, but it's the standard convention. 
what you're going to do is take and spike a series of seven samples with three times the instrument detection limit that you just measured using nitric acid. So you're going to put a little tiny bit of lead in and then you're going to make the measurements just like you did before and get a standard deviation. And three times that standard deviation is the method detection limit. So let me show you graphically what that looks like. Okay, so what I've drawn here is kind of a comparison. The green is the standard deviation from the instrument detection limit. It was taken on actual blanks. But for the method detection limit, you're adding just a little bit of lead, and you're probably going to get a bigger standard deviation. And that standard deviation is going to be what you use as your method detection limit. So almost always you first measure your blank, and from that you can define what the concentration of lead should be for your MDL. Again, these are a lot of these things are rules of thumb, but they're important because you'll see them again and again. And if you read carefully what your handouts say, you'll also see that they define MDL and IDL very similarly with one really important difference that I'm wondering who, who of you out there will catch. Okay, so that's an MDL. It's going to be bigger than the IDL, and it's going to be probably be the best reflection of what the detection limit would be specifically for lead, specifically in the samples you most care about. Now, what I want to talk about in this kind of busy slide is why we have an IDL, MDL versus something else called a limit of quantification. And it's a little bit hard to follow, so if you're a little bit confused after this, don't worry, it is a little confusing. And I would send you to the wiki site that's out there on detection limits, because it sort of goes over the same thing. So what I want you to do is focus your attention on this left graph here. What you see is a blank, which is the pink. And let's say that blank you have, and you're doing a bunch of measurements on, and you've created this detection limit line. And the detection limit is a bright line that says, if you're above that in your measurement, yes, you have lead. And if you measure below that, no, you don't. So a detection limit kind of is this sharp demarcation between, yes, there's lead, and no, there's not, which, of course, is imperfect, because there's always a chance it's wrong. So in this case, as you can see from where it's drawn, because it's three times the standard deviation, then if you have a true, true zero value, it's only a 1% chance that you would, in the single measurement, find it to exceed the detection limit. So what's interesting is by setting the detection limit to be three times the standard deviation, you've made it incredibly hard to get a false positive. If you're running a sample that truly has no lead in it, the odds are you're really, really going to be able to say that it doesn't have lead. Okay, so it's going to be really good with what we call true blanks, and it's not going to give false negatives. Let's look at the converse over here. Now, in this case, your sample does have lead. It's got, in fact, exactly three times the standard deviation of lead, and like anything, it's going to be normally distributed. If you did the measurement, 50% of the time, it's going to be larger than its value, and 50% of the time, smaller, and maybe sometimes exactly at it. So anyhow, the problem is that your detection limit is set exactly at the average because it's 3s and that's where this perfect sample is. It's a lead sample that happens to contain the detection limit quantity of lead. Well, 50% of the time you're going to be right and you're going to think that it has lead, but 50% of the time you're going to be wrong. So you're going to get basically a 50% chance of a false negative if you have lead. And that's maybe okay. It kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve in the measurement. And it's kind of a hard situation. And you might ask, why don't you just say the detection limit is, I don't know, 10s? And so in that case, you're never ever going to have a chance of, for example, thinking that there would be lead when there really isn't. So the false negative is actually not that improved at 10s. And in point of fact, if you made that to de the detection limit, you're still going to be in this conundrum where 50% of the time, you're going to actually think that there's something not there when there is. And that's just intrinsic. You couldn't place this anywhere and not get out of the problem of false negatives when you have sample present. I'll let you chew on that. Anyhow, what I am going to tell you is that the limit of quantification, which has got a statistical background I don't have time to go into, is conventionally defined as tennis. And it's a different bright line. If the detection limit tells you, yes, I have the lead, or no, I don't, the limit of quantification tells you if I have more than that amount, I can actually tell you how much I have. So it's really interesting in analytical analysis, particularly of you know, atoms using atomic spectroscopy, is sometimes you can know something's there, but you can't actually quantify how much is there until you get up to the limit of quantification. So oftentimes you'll see that reported in literature is they'll just say there's star, 
And that star means we know it's present with some probability. We just don't know how much is there. So 10s is called the limit of quantification. And the standard deviation you use is the same standard deviation used to calculate the method detection limit. So some quick examples. You might want to pause and go over these yourself. So in this example, um, one of my questions is, what are you calculating? So you got 10 replicate measures, and it's just concentrated nitric, so it has to be instrument detection limit. And it's super simple. You just take three times the standard deviation shown over there to the left. There you have it. Another quick example, you're doing seven replicate measurements. Now you have a solution spiked with lead, a little tiny bit. OK, that's going to be an example of a method detection limit. And what you're going to do here is you're going to be able to just take three times that standard deviation. And remember, 10 times that standard deviation is the limit of quantification. Notice here I'm using 3.14. That is intentional because that is actually the number that is used in your reading. And I wanted to specifically emphasize that in defining the method detection limit, I can't tell you precisely exactly what every single chemist is going to do. I have books that sometimes use 3.14. Sometimes they take a different t-value because this is actually a t-value. Sometimes they'll use 3. On average, it's 3. But the specific reading you have, for some reason, they chose 3.14. And you can actually read and see what they were thinking. And of course, the limit of quantification is 10 times s. Now, I just want to make you aware of a final method that sometimes is used for detection limits, which is in spectroscopy. So in this case, over here on the left, what you see is a peak with a bunch of flat line around it. When what you can do is zoom in to the flat line, which is, in effect, your noise. And you can measure the background noise by taking three times the standard deviation of some amount of background. Now, what that basically says is if that signal shown up here gets small enough you can't distinguish it from the noise. And so often in spectroscopy, rather than the processes I just described, where you're measuring 10 different samples and getting a single number, if you have a spectrum in which the signal is shown on top of basically zero value data, you can sometimes use this approach. A true blue analytical chemist would not want to call that a detection limit. But in spectroscopy, we, also talk, we often talk about signal to noise ratios. And I just wanted to define that and warn you that sometimes people will take the standard deviation of that and use that as an estimate of the detection limit. So I hope you've gotten a sense of what detection limits are from this lecture. Please go look at that Wikipedia page, because I think it has a pretty good discussion. And perhaps you can think through what it means to have a false negative or a false positive in these measurements. And remember, there are two types of detection limits, instrument and method. And they're different because you have to actually experimentally determine them in different ways. The limit of quantification, you build off of the method detection limit. And as I explained, instead of three times the standard deviation of the method detection limit data, it's 10 times the standard deviation. Thanks so much for being here, and see you next time.